Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. And this week we're joined all the way from London with Joy Aboim. Joy, how are you? I'm very well, Jonathan. Happily excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to do this one too. You wrote in, um, you're a triathlete, and you wrote in that uh, you had gone through, that you actually, I think you might have written me right after this, but Ironman Hamburg you were able to complete Ironman Hamburg and it means a lot considering your past with triathlon. And I want to get into that today and talk about the barriers that you overcame. I want to talk about, uh, the, the, the agony of defeat and going through the challenges and, and then what made you decide to, instead of leaving it just as business unresolved that you could leave in the past, what made you decide to take it head on? Um, but before we do that, uh, I want to get into a little bit, you mentioned that you were a runner and then you got into triathlon. So was that like, uh, were you the, the sort of athlete that's a runner gone triathlon that commonly is like, I'll just make it through on the bike and I'll make it through on the swim or what was your approach to triathlon? Like with those three different disciplines at that point, it was interesting. Cause yes, I did come from running, um, started running probably about five or so years before I then moved into probably six years actually before I moved into triathlon. And, uh, I was kind of looking for a new challenge. It's pretty much as simple as that. So I had been running for a while and I had done this uh, this activity. It was a kind of a multi-event activity at work where we kind of compete with other corporate organizations. It was a multi-day, multi-event thing. And it kind of got me you know, really excited and wanted to do something more. So I thought, what else could I do or what could I do? And in triathlon just happened. And so... Um, my swim wasn't that wonderful. I could just about swim. So I had to work on the swim. So I actually um, started to, uh, I joined a, an intermediate swimming class. Um, I think I did that for about 11 weeks or so. Um, and so started to work on my swimming and then joined a, a triathlete um, team. Actually, they would come into the leisure center after my swimming class. And so I kind of, you know, had a chat with the coach and he thought, you know what, you're not too bad. So yes, you can come and join us. And so um, I started to swim and, and train with them. Um, the bike, I could ride a bicycle. Um, I didn't actually consider it so much a, a weakness, I would say, um, because of the distances I was doing. So doing sprint and doing Olympic distance, I always found that I could make up the time on the run so I could just have a reasonably good bike, bike or yeah, reasonably good bike and then make up time on the run. And, uh, and that kind of, kind of worked. So I had to just work on the swimming, get out there biking, and, um, and and that was it. I kind of liked them all, and that was um, that was fine. One of the things that was a bit tricky was the open water swimming at the time. So actually <laughs> transitioning from from pool swim to open water, um, yeah, that required a complete mind shift. Mind mind shift. Yeah, because uh, so what was particularly challenging about it was it sighting and staying on pace, or was it dealing with the waves and undulations and the trying to time breathing? I. I, I I speaking from personal experience and sucking so bad at swimming, <laughs> I can't imagine going through it. Yeah. It was, I think it was like, it, it's, it's a lot of it is, is in the mind, right? It's like, I can see the bottom of a pool. I can stand in the bottom of the pool, whether I need to or not, but I'm going into this open water space. I can't see the bottom. I can't stand in the bottom. And it's just, I don't know, it's just that kind of thing. I'm thinking, what if I need to stop? Okay, you tread water, but okay, but what if I need to stop? You tread. So it was just kind of all of that. Um, it was quite, it, it took a little while. And, and the only way you could, I got over it really was actual, was practice really. It was, mm. you know, getting accustomed to it, going in there and realizing, yes, it's, you know, you tread water, if you need to stop a bit, a bit, you can actually just stay there. Glad for wetsuits that help give that buoyancy as well. Um, and so, yeah. It took a little, it took me a few seasons actually to be a bit, a bit more comfortable open water swimming. And then those mass starts as well, because in triathlon, you'd always have these, um, these, these mass starts. So everybody's in the water and then the, the gun goes and then we're scrambling sort of thing, you know, and those things could always be a bit, a bit unnerving. Yeah. And all that affects your breathing so directly. You know, uh, when you carry that extra tension in the nerves and then when your breathing rate goes off, then it compounds and you find yourself totally out of breath. Oh gosh. Yeah. I, I'm getting panicked just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so was your swim, um, relatively speaking, you were a good runner. Was your swim, your second place discipline or was that the bike? Uh, where did they kind of fall in that cascading order? 
people would always ask me that. And I didn't know whether I could separate the two. But the, the, the thing with the swim was always that that mass starts and then the open water and then that, that kind of anxiety of that. But I knew that I could, I could, you know, as I swam the distance, I could, I could do the distance. I also think that I'd, I'd kind of put them on par, mm-hmm. really. I'll put them together. I couldn't separate the two. Um, but I would always know that once I was out of the pool, oh, sorry, I say pool, out of the water, it would be like, phew, we've done this. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's get onto the bike now. Because actually that was like, yes, I suppose then the hardest part in my mind thinking now I'm on the, on the bike and then we can get through that and then get onto the run, which is the, the, the most, uh, the most uh, enjoyable part. And I would always say that actually, because it was always like, you know, let's get these other bits done quickly so we can go running sort of thing. And uh, it kind of always kind of gave me the fuel to, uh, to, 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 to press on and to push on. Yeah. Now the challenge with that is that you have the compounding effect of having two disciplines that were, that were not your strengths and relying heavily on the final discipline, right. In the sense that with time cuts or with being in slower traffic and being caught behind people, or just even having to deal with the elements since you are, if there's bad weather, if there's anything else, you spend more time out in those conditions earlier on your run can be super fast, but it's tough to make that up. Right. And, mm-hmm. and cyclists that go into triathlon many times, they, they benefit from having that middle ground, that really long stretch is their relative strength. That's when they spend most time out on course in that one discipline. And that's when they're on the bike. So it can, you know, having that being a strength is really helpful. What, what made you decide to go from the sprint and Olympic distances to go to the, the Ironman distance sort of triathlons that the really long ones? Well, it's um, a bit of a story, but when I decided to take up a triathlon, I, I in, in typical fashion, I, I got myself a book. And so I, I read this book. It was um, Triathlon 101. I forget the author now. It's just escaped me. And um, in there, I had read that to be an, a triathlete, you had to do at least one event a year. But if you did an Ironman, you'd be forever a triathlete, whether you did one ever, ever again. And I'm thinking, yeah, I want to be a forever triathlete. And so yeah. I had known from the beginning that I would do one. I think the question really was, was which, what well, perhaps more when I would do it. And I think after, after about, I think it was about seven or eight, seven seasons of, of triathlon. And I kind of came to the realization that, you know, I'd crossed the line and fine, I would have exerted myself and I would feel triumphant, but I'd crossed the line. And I think, you know, there wasn't that real, Mm. You, ch- you challenged yourself. And I kind of, you know, after that time came to the realization that it was that I needed another challenge. And so it was perhaps now time ready to do the Ironman. Yeah. Uh, so Ironman, let's talk. It was your first one, Ironman Copenhagen. That's correct. Yes. And when was that? So Ironman Copenhagen was in uh, 2017. 2017. 2017. How that's a huge jump up going from Olympic distance. And then I don't think you did. Did you do a half prior to that? I, I, I did actually I did a half in 2012. 2012 was a great year, London Olympic yeah. year. So I did a 12, yeah. I did a half in that year. Um, and um, it was kind of like, yeah, I suppose I was looking for another challenge and I did that. Um, that was okay. It was a sea swim. That was rough. That was very rough. Um, but then of course we had to get to the, and so I did that in 2012 and then just carried on with the Olympic and sprint distances, you know, in the, um, in the in-between time. And so, you know, by the time I came to the realization, yes, I went, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the fall. And then I yeah. thought, um, this is kind of new. I mean, I'm, of course, runner, triathletes, so used to structured training, used to mot- self-motivation, used to, you know, getting up and getting out. But I thought this is kind of like really big. And so I thought I'd have a, I'd get a coach as well. And so um, I actually did enlist a coach um, to, to, to help. And not so much with, um, with the, the, the training necessarily, but I, it was really, I wanted to kind of maybe benefit from the learning process too. You know, I'd done everything mm-hmm. by myself in terms of, um, yeah, I'd done everything by, by myself to, 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 to date, to that date. And so it was, I thought it'd be nice to get some, some professional, if you will, insight into, you know, training, into development, into progress, into why, you know, the plan might be this way or why to do that, et cetera. And so it was the kind of the whys and the wherefores of, of the training. And so, yes, I engaged the professional. Yeah. So how did the race go? <laughs> it's interesting, actually. Um, it was interesting. It was, it was a bit, it was a bit rough to begin with. 
Yeah. It was a bit rough to begin with, actually, to be to be candid. Um, and I think it was because um, when I was asking questions, there was a sense that maybe I was questioning authority or expect questioning the expertise. When I actually was, I was just trying to understand the process, and so I was clear to say, "This is actually what I'm. This is this is my intention. This is my objective." Um, but when I realized that it wasn't going down so well, I thought, okay, just fine, just, just do what you need to do, right? And and forget all the other bits. And so just 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 do as you're told, you know, type mm. thing. Mm. And so um, so 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 yes, I did that. Yeah. And then going to like Ironman Copenhagen, let's talk, let's talk through that race. Your big it's a huge event, your first mm-hmm. full distance one, probably windy, knowing Copenhagen, probably cold water also, knowing Copenhagen. How did the race end up unfolding for you? It was interesting, actually. I got there um, and uh, went out with some friends. And I was a bit apprehensive about the swim, again, to be honest. I mean, I had done, at that point, I had done marathons before. So I'd run marathons before. I had done a few centuries as well on the bike. Um, I'd never swum that distance, 3.8K swim. Um, I think I would have done it, of course, in the training or perhaps slightly less than that in the training. But it was still a bit daunting. Mm. Um and um, and you get to self seed, you know, and so it, for for the swims, the swim pens, um, you know, how long you expect that it might take you, and so you seed accordingly. And so I seeded, um, tested the water out actually. Oh, I had a surprise there, I have to say, because um, I've gone out with some friends, and um, when we got to this, when I got to the swim start, I just went into bit to test the water with others. And I came out and my brother and my niece were, were, were there, which oh, was um, cool. most unexpected. Um, but anyway, the waters were actually quite nice. It was actually my best swim. It was like it was like I was being pushed along the water. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, oh, cool. it, was, it was a beautiful swim. And it really buoyed me up. You know, when I got out of the water, I thought, oh, my word, we finished the swim. We, we, are, we, we have this. We've got this. We're on the way. You know, and yeah. so I was really excited. I was really, I was really, um, you know, just like the previous events, you know, you finally get out of the water and then it's the run and the bike and, you know, we, we can do this. And so I got onto the bike. <clears throat> the weather they had said was going to be a bit, you know, here and there. And I think, well, I think that that's, that's, that's a, a lesson that I learned. Um, and so I kind of faffed about a bit in, in transition. But anyway, got onto the bike. Um, and then headed out and it was okay it was windy it was really windy um, mm. but it was okay I pushed but what was and I kept on going at the uh, at the at the swim start you know they kept on making this announcement of you know every athlete will get nine hours and 30 minutes to do the swim and the bike to the swim and the bike and as I had planned with my coach what our race strategy really was was, you know, if you have a good swim and if you could, you know, if you can do, you know, 20, 22, 23 um, uh, KPH on the bike, you know, that will be fine, you know, and save the legs for running. And so we were okay. And I was doing okay, you know, according to my time, according to everything. Um, and it was a bit hard. I would, I would confess that the, 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 the bike stage was a bit hard. It was too loop. But we're pressing on and I'm thinking I'm doing this and it's always hard anyway. It's, it's, it's never easy mm-hmm. coming, you know, and so you just push through. And then I get to start the second loop as I'm anticipating actually now starting to, to, to get onto the second loop. And, uh, and I get stopped by this marshal. And he points to his watch and he tells me um, that I've, I've, I've hit the, the 1345 cutoff and his watch says 13. 46 and I said it's by a minute you know I mean I'm thinking cut off yeah. how minutes anyway you know and it was it was awful he he, he it, it was it was awful he wouldn't let me go he wouldn't let me carry on um and then um, I'm thinking okay and then he wants to take my timing chip and I'm thinking okay at least let me let me you know just ride back to to um to to t2 which was about 20 kilometers away um he calls his, his um, he calls a colleague over, and I'm thinking for some reason I don't know why I thought this, but I thought for some reason that they were going to just I don't know confirm and say okay you go on ahead or something like that I don't know, yeah. um, but actually what they did what he he did was he asked the guy to uh, to take the timing chip off me, uh. and they stripped it off my ankle, and it was the most um, it was the most 
humiliating feeling, actually, I have to say. I was so, I just felt, and there's spectators and there's everybody there. And I just felt so violated in a sense. Um, mm. And then I, I I got back on the bike. Well, I was actually still on the bike because I kind of was just across it. Um, you know, sat on it, pedaled, and I had to then pedal back to T2. And what was also difficult about that was that you know I'm now in amongst these mostly men you know uh-huh. who are like the fast guys you know uh-huh. powering back you know to to t2 and um and I'm thinking okay you're gonna have to pucker up and just you know pedal like mad and see how much you can fit in with those guys somewhat somehow you know and sure. not be too much out of place and so, you know, through through tears, and I confess, I, I was I was heartbroken because it had been six mm. months of of, um, of com- committed, dedicated training, and I just felt so robbed of not having the chance to do it, and not actually understanding how come. Mm. Um, because I'm still thinking, I mean, I've only been five hours and a half into this. You know, we've got, you know, we we we've got four hours. Yeah. Anyway, I get back down there. Get into t- get into transition, um, and you can't actually. There's no other. There's no other way to actually come out. Obviously, you know, you, you have to transition and go into the run. And so I had to transition to the run, and go off out of the the, the, the run out, and be on the run course. And people were cheering because, of course, at that time, they hadn't seen. I think they had seen. I would have been one of two females they would have seen at that time. Right. So I thought that you were leading. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. I felt like a fraud. I felt so it was really oh. um it was really it was really heavy actually, I have to say. It was really, really awful. And then I at some point, I think maybe some 200, 300 meters, uh, there was a feed station and some porta loops, and I just was able to find a way to just, you know, just kind of get out, you know, just mm-hmm. and then I went, you know, caught up with my friends, went to the hotel, and I I was just, I was just, I was just but I was just bawling my eyes out. It was, I was just so grief struck. Um, and I still couldn't understand what had gone on. I, I picked up the, 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 um, the athlete's guide that I, I had printed out and read through and was trying to look to know what had happened and why it had happened and, and why wasn't I aware? Why wasn't my coach aware? Why, why didn't we put this into our, our race strategy? Um, and you could see there in, in very tiny print, some of those, the cutoff on, you know, lap t- loop two of the of the of the bike stage 1345 i'm thinking so yes yeah, so that was it it um mm. it was it was heartbreak it took me it took me more than you know no, more than the training time to actually feel better about that and actually I, I don't think that i fully felt better about it healed from it until um hamburg in in in, in truth because it was it was also compounded by some other some other bit of drama. Um, but because I hadn't done the run, I was chatting with one of the, uh, the athletes the, the, the next morning, um, or it was even that evening. And he had said, you know, you've not done the run, so your legs should be really still good. You know, you've, you've put in all that training and that you should, he kind of suggested, or he did suggest, you know, find another event in a, in a, in a you know, soon, four weeks and, and go straight for it. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, I thought about it and I came back when I got back to the UK, I, I discussed it with my, with my coach and, and he, he, he thought to do the same thing. I think also, and I, I think he was probably also feeling a bit bad that he hadn't actually spotted or, you know, the intermediate the time cut. Yeah. 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 Um, and so he said, yes, we should go ahead and let, let's do that. And so I signed up for, um, Ironman, um, Emilio, Emilia Romagna in, um, in, in, in Italy. Yeah. And uh four weeks it was, almost a four weeks exactly it was. And so I got out into I got out to got out there. And I really don't know what happened, actually. Mm. I really don't know what happened. I was everything was okay, it seemed. Um got into got, got to the swim that race that swim that that morning. And uh maybe a few, maybe a, a thousand meters or so into the swim. And I started to feel my body just started to feel a bit weird. And I kind of was having, I had cramps in my legs, in my, in my, in my, um, in my, um, in my calves, in my thighs, in my, my, my quads, in my gastronomics, uh, gastronomics muscles. And, and I couldn't understand how come, because I would never usually have cramps in a swim. 
you know, if I was having cramps or anything tight, it would be my feet. And it was if the water waters were cold and, and, and I'd been in there for a while. And so I really, it was just, everything just seemed a little bit off. And so actually at one point I actually had to hold on to um, one of the, the Marshall raft, Marshall's um, rafts and try and just work out the cramp. But anyway, I, Got out of the suit. It was one of those Australian exits. I had done one of those before. Mm. Um, so came out of of um, of um, it. I think it was about two thousand five hundred. Ran across the beach, went back in, and then did the last um, one three hundred. I came out and um, just you know, chatted to my my brothers. I was running through to transition. I just said, you know, that was that was a tough swim. You know, it was, mm-hmm. and it was not tough because it's tough. You know, you're exerting sure. yourself. It was just tough because the body just didn't seem. Just didn't seem didn't seem fit enough or ready or I don't know something was wrong. Anyway, got onto the bike and uh, pedaled and it was good. It was all nice and I'm thinking, okay, we're all good. We've passed that and 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 I was still I'm thinking we've done that. Let's let's carry on and it just seemed like it was going okay. But then as I carried on into the bike. And I was very mindful of cutoffs, actually. And something else I had done. <laughs> I was, was going to ask actually, you that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was very mindful of cutoffs. And actually something else I had also learned from the last event was to um, to be ambitious in the place I seated myself on the swim. Mm. And so, you know, I, I seated myself with, um, with, with cutoffs in mind and giving myself extra time. Um, because had I seated, and in fact, I'd learned that from one of the, um, the ladies I'd met um, in Copenhagen, because she had seated herself about 20 minutes before I had. And she had said, no, that there was no way she could have swum at that, at that pace and complete in that time, but she was giving herself that extra time. Mm. Um, and That's so I good, did that as well. It's a good tip for a lot of um, athletes that are kind of coming into this and are new at that. Um, even though in an ideal world, everyone would have like very clear expectations on like, and, and line up exactly where they should. They often line up further ahead than they actually should. Uh, and then what that hap- what that creates is that cascading effect so that everybody else then has to also line up earlier. Cause if you are realistic with your expectations, you'll be so far back that you could suffer, you know, you could fall on the wrong side of a time cut and yeah, yeah it's which- the reality. Yep. It is, which is kind of unfair. And I think really what should happen is that they should allow people to see themselves honestly in quotes um, yes. and actually make any sort of on-course cutoffs, take, have those on, on, on-course cutoffs, be cognizant of that. Be relevant you know, that, to your, that, that yeah, related wave. to your start time. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. You know, because yeah. that's the, um, that's the only just and fair way because I, I honestly felt penalized for, <laughs> for not so much being a slower swimmer, but from just what by starting later. Uh-huh. And so anyway, I had seated earlier and um, carried on on the bike in, in um, Emilia Romagna. It was beautiful. It was a lovely day as well. And, uh, and then um, I just really started to cramp, you know, and I just kind of worked through and just carry on pedaling, um, just carrying on pedaling. And it was kind of a nice kind of route. It was a kind of nice and undulating. It was one big, you know, bit of a hill. And so you could kind of like, I was still able to pedal reasonably well. Um, Tracking very nicely, actually, very nicely indeed. Um, and then I just got to a point where, I don't know, it, it, there weren't cramps anymore, but my boss body was kind of like in spasms. It was most mm. weird. And so I had to try and you know, find a place. I, I kind of got off my bike, and that was difficult because everything was just, yeah, you know. And then... Um, found a little spot. There was one of the, the motorcycle marshals that cu- had come and came to my aid as well. And, uh, and um, I think he had also called the ambulance and I'm thinking, I'll be fine. You know, I'll just take a moment. And I, I still had, I think I had a, you know, good comfortable time to actually get back on the bike and get to transition and then get, get on second loop and carry on. So I was really tracking quite well. And uh, I, um, I, 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 I it took me a good while, but, you know, probably 45 minutes later when I realized nothing was actually letting up, mm. um, that I wasn't actually going to be getting on my bike and carrying on. I mean, mm. I was in, in the kind of pain and contortions that, that, that just caused me to cry. I mean, it was, it was so painful. I didn't really know what to do. And in the end, the ambulance came and they, um, they ambulanced me away. Oh. Um, so, um, I mean, it was a drama. It was, it was, it was drama. Um, and so I think that, well, not what I think that really did just kind of heap upon 
the, the, the pains of Copenhagen. Um, yeah. And so there was this whole question as to, you know, what was I actually doing here? And did I actually belong in this space? And, you know, all that kind of self-doubt that comes in um, that, that doesn't really help, you know, the mind yeah. and doesn't help you um, push through or push on. Certainly. Yeah, it certainly doesn't help. And, and when you have, um, when you have a failure or a challenge, uh, like that, and then you have a second one that comes in such close proximity to that, what it feels like is it feels like it's validation of the doubt or the fears or anything else that you felt in that moment. Um, at this point, what was your reaction in terms of looking forward? Were you thinking, well, I really want to figure this out. Or were you thinking, I just don't belong in, in this long distance triathlon stuff? Or where were you at in terms of looking down the road with your relationship in triathlon? I, I guess I kind of didn't think I was going to give up because remember I was going to be a forever triathlete. Yeah, um, that's right. So I knew, I, I, I knew I just had to, I had to do whatever I needed to do to to be able to realize what I wanted to do. Um, so when I came back, um, I think I, I well, I decided that I would I'd, I'd do something else because I was thinking, should I just go back and in 2018, you know, do sign up for another one, or should I just take a year off, you know, thinking Iron Man full distance and just you know do do other things. And so I decided that I would actually just step away slightly and do other things. And so what I did was it was pretty cool. I did this. Um, I called it. Um, and I got it from a friend. It was a medal, a, a, a medal a month challenge. Mm. So every every month I'd do some event where I'd get some 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 medal, as it were. And um, I was actually able to do all sorts of things. So whether it was run, do a, just a run, or a swim, or a bike, or a triathlon, you know. And so I did all sorts of things for every month of that uh, of that year. Um, and it was really healing, actually, because what it mm. what it did was it helped me um, have these small little goals, achieve something, feel good, um, and then carry on and do something else. And it was really it was it was really it was really good. It was really nice. I did actually I did, actually did a half in that year as well. So I did another half mm. in that year. Um, that was my um, that was my September challenge. Actually, September is my birth month, and so I did I did two challenges in that month just for good <laughs> measure. <laughs> How cool, um, what a great way to rebuild confidence is to find like, cause that happens to everybody at every level, you lose confidence in where you're mm -hmm. at, but going back to what you can do well and executing on that and then going through and putting yourself into new experiences, but that you can still execute on and, and accomplish. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's a fantastic approach. Super smart. Yeah, it was brilliant. And it really did help. It really helped a lot. Um, and it was really from there that I thought, okay, you know, we can start to plan for when we would, you know, consider doing the, uh, the Ironman, the full Ironman distance challenge. Yeah. So what, what was your plan there in terms of <clears throat> how are you going to go about doing it differently? Um, was it, and were you putting off the experiences of the past and hoping that, Hey, like I've proven to myself that I can do these hard things that I can do this. So I I'll just go back to it. Or were you trying to actually solve and kind of tussle with those demons that you had? It's interesting. I mean, I knew whatever I needed to do was that I needed to be a faster cyclist. I mean, I had come to that conclusion and I, and I came to that conclusion really you know, in Copenhagen because I remember quite distinctly on the, on the, on the bike course, um, probably some 70 kilometers or so in, there was this guy um, that comes, you know, powering past me and he's carrying on. And I had seen him. He'd we'd been in the same, we'd been in the same um swim, swim pen. Um, and he had he, I think it had it, he had had a difficult swim. So he I was perhaps a stronger swimmer than than he. In fact, I wasn't perhaps, I was a stronger swimmer than he. Mm. He was a better cyclist than I. Mm. Yeah. And I saw him on the uh on the run course. You know, you know at that time, and that was really kind of difficult, you know, at that time when you know, in when the sun has gone down and you still have the athletes running, you're thinking, I am yeah. supposed to be in amongst that group of people. You know, that's mm -hmm. my group of people. I wasn't now I'm never gonna do it in in eight hours or nine hours or eleven hours. You know, this is my group of people and I should have been there. And so I remember seeing him as well. There I remember him distinctly because um on the other thing that's difficult about that self-doubt is 
when you are under, underrepresented in a field such as that, mm-hmm. there is this additional, um, this is additional, this additional layer mm-hmm. of weight and not belonging. You know, I know everybody or many an athlete, if not every athlete sometimes feels, you know, self-doubt and not belonging. But, you know, when you're underrepresented in a field, it, it's just a slightly heavier. And I remember seeing, I remember him noticing him because he was, he's a, he's a black guy as well. And um, so he was quite, again, distinguished, distinguishable for me. And I'm thinking, you know, if I had been as strong a cyclist as he, I would be on the run course with him. Uh-huh. You know, and so I knew I had to be a stronger cyclist. And so actually in that, that 2018 year of, of my medal a month, I did quite a few um, cycling um, challenges as well. Um, again, just to kind of work on, work on my bike, work on my bike. And then it was at the end of 2019 that uh, there was a colleague of mine and he talks, I talked to me about, um, about, uh, about Trainer Road. In fact, he had used it for... Um, to train for a century, We've got this ride London, the legacy from the uh, the mm-hmm. Olympic Games, mm-hmm. um, which I've done a few times. And he was he was and I was actually doing it that year too. And he was training using Trainer Road to train for that in that 2019. And uh, he gave me a you know the, the referral licenses, which I then tried, and I thought you know this is actually pretty good. So I then got myself a smart trainer because I was I was determined to work on the bike. Mm you know, to, to, to become more proficient. And it wasn't that I, I couldn't do a distance. I just had to be stronger. I had to be more efficient, more uh-huh. proficient at it. And so um, I uh, got myself a smart trainer, um, used the, 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 the uh, four week uh, license, uh, referral license. And um, I became a, a trainer road, um, roadie, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Um, it was just, it's kind of like built for me sort of, you know, because what you have is you've got, you've got the structured training and we like structure, don't we? We like to build and mm-hmm. to grow. It has the, uh, the, um, the, the coaching through it, you know, mm-hmm. the explanations, the things that I was looking for, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. You know, how can I learn from this and apply it then? You know, and so it had all of that, you know, w- one thing I sometimes actually when I'm doing one of those, especially one of those VO2 max ones and you're trying to read and I'm thinking, Chad, I can't read and pedal at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we know we know Chad does that and listens to classical music and prepares dinner while he does this. We don't know how, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was so amazing. And then actually, so I had so I signed up for I signed up for um for Ironman Hamburg 2020. It was supposed mm-hmm. to be in June of 2020, and um, I'd have got myself a nice six month training plan. I had used the the, the plan builder. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was going to be with for medium, mid, mid, mid volume. Yeah. And, uh, and started training. And then of course, um, um, COVID happened. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And that had its, um, that had its own challenges really in terms of what to do and how to do it. No doubt. And how did that affect? So you had mentioned that your colleague was the one that re- that referred trainer road to you and, but what were you, what do you do for work? And then how did COVID affect that? And in turn, how did that affect your ability to train? Train. That's actually interesting, you know, because um, it's, it's, it's kind of two-sided in a sense. So I work in tech, I work for um, a, a, a technology company and um, you know, we would travel a lot, do a lot of outs, a lot of, you know, traveling around. Um, and so what was interesting about COVID was the fact that there was no traveling. Mm. You know, you can't travel. And so in a sense, it allowed me to be true to my training. Mm-hmm. You know, and, the, and and then, of course, because you were not even, even if you weren't traveling out of town, out of the country, the need not to go into the office, you know, I was, you know, I, I just I'd do the training, you know, and so it kind of afforded me more time to be, to be, to be um, plain about it. Yeah. Um, and but but of course you're training and you're not sure about the event. So there were all sorts of other things that were kind of just crazy and all of that. But what I then decided was that, you know, because I needed the, I needed the focus to keep me anchored anyway, you know, because it, everything was, was, was up in the air really in terms of, you know, it was, it was a novel situation for everybody. 
Um, and so at least keeping and having routine was important for me to actually just kind of keep focused and to, to, to at least have some element of control, you know, in a certain sense. Uh, and so I just, um, I just kind of trained as if the event was going to be happening mm. and just carried on with that in mind. Yeah. Cause I, was, I said to myself, you know what, what's the worst that could happen? I'll be, a, you know, forget that the event might be canceled, but I could be a foster cyclist. Right. And that's really yeah. what I'm aspiring to be. That's and it. so it was like, just keep going for it. And so that's exactly what I did. And so I just carried on. And then it was perhaps in, um, in the April or so, yes, it was April of, of that 2020, um, that Ironman Hamburg said um, that they will, um, that they will first of all come back to us. And then later on, they said about after four weeks, they kind of said, you know, they will postpone the events to the September of that year. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kind of left me in the, in, in the, in the quandary, really. I wasn't too sure what to do because yeah. I'm thinking, you know, September, in the UK, we've not done so very well. Nobody's done so very well, but we've not done we've not done so very well. Um, mm. And uh, um, I began to think, you know, in Germany, they perhaps managed it a lot better than we have. And I realised that I couldn't that I couldn't work on their timetable. You know, it might be okay for yeah. them to have an event, but you know, I didn't know whether I could even travel out or whether I was ready to. Besides which. We couldn't even swim. The, the, the pools and everything were closed. There was nothing really going on. <clears throat> and so they had given the option as well to defer. And so I opted to defer to 2020, 2021. So it was going to be in June in 2021. Um, and so I then kind of carried on with my training plan because I thought that was a cool thing to do because, you know, I, I still had the aspiration of being that you know, that's stronger, faster cyclist. And so I carried on doing that. Um, kind of training and I kind of um, laughed at myself on, on that the fact that I was now a dual athlete as opposed to a triathlete because all I was doing was running and biking <laughs> I carried on I carried on with that but what was also quite liberating about it was the fact that I wasn't training for anything really mm-hmm. you're you know, just training to I've train always been, yeah and I think I've always been training for something so it was kind of nice not to actually I don't know to kind of not you know, and just 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 ride your bike, just get on the trainer, you know, go for fun rides, do various other things, you know. And so I was able to do that to perhaps a lot more than I than I I have I tend to or I ever have, especially you know, training for an Ironman, because then every amount of time is precious. And because you've only got limited amounts of it in a day, you can't think, oh, I'll go on that social ride or I'll go and hang out and do that. But no, because I've got two hours and I've got to do it now, and I've still got other things I need to do. Yeah. And so it kind of just um, freed me up a little bit more. And, um, and and so, yes, and so that was it. And, and then in the end, what happened was we couldn't do it in June. I think it was about in March that they decided that it was going to have to be in August. So they postponed it to August um, when the vaccine programs had started to take better hold in Germany. Because it, interestingly, then we were we were ahead in terms of vaccine programs and vaccinations um, than Germany and so um, you know they had to catch up but what it did do then for me was allowed me time to swim because the pools then opened up the outdoor pools opened up at the end of March for us of 20 of 2021 and uh, and I thought okay fine I could because I, I I thought I could I could quite easily in eight weeks get myself in good bike swim shape to uh, to um to to do that 3.8k um but then of course they had actually postponed the event to August and so I had a, another six months of training which actually at the time sounded quite a lot and I was almost disheartened by the fact that six months again you know yeah I just just carried on and carried on do you and think then, that in oh, this process you had kind of like um you, you had like a, a you you had work to do on your relationship with the bike right after uh the experiences that you had at Copenhagen and then also in Italy Uh, And this experience of giving you a lot of time to spend with the bike and also giving you time just to enjoy coffee rides and and enjoy the more social side of it. I'm sure it really helped um, with with your relationship on the bike. It did actually, but I I wouldn't say my relationship on the bike was bad. I still love my bike in spite of those things that happened. Mm. You know, I still love going out on the bike, whether it was training or hanging out with friends or or, or whatever. So I still did still enjoyed those. Um, I think what was interesting or what was good was that I was just getting, I suppose, 
really the way I assess it is more time to get stronger, to get faster. And that was really happening. I could actually see it. And my FTP, it didn't go up so humongously, Uh but I knew that I was, that I was stronger. You know, I could do a certain route that I might have done before in time past and find out that I'm, I'm three, four KPH faster than I had been before or find yeah. myself powering up a hill a lot easier than I had ever powered up it before. And so there was a lot of things there that I'd actually seen. I think the other thing really was, was again, a lot in the mind too, because through the podcast, when you're talking about fueling, um, you know, recovery, um, some of the bike technique and efficiency, just actually having a space where you are talking about cycling and everybody is, it's kind of feel safe and people are, are, are sharing freely and you're learning equally freely and you're thinking mm. oh so that's just not my paranoia then oh everybody's kind of like that <laughs> yeah. you know and it kind of yeah. gives you that sort of comfort yeah. thing right and so there was a lot for me that it wasn't just about the bike but it was also just about that I learned through those podcasts through through the podcasts mm. that you guys do which have really been um absolutely instrumental uh mm. for, for me really because I think fueling was one of those big ones I would tend to do a fasted ride or a fasted workout, not because I, not because I was worried about weight or anything, but I don't know, just because, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it's, so it's early. Yeah. yeah. It's too early. I can't eat. And, and I just go out and do the workout and then I come back and then I eat and then I carry on. But I, I learned to pay more attention, closer attention to the fueling and then the recovery so that I could be ready again for the next, um, uh, of a, a session especially as they were obviously there were loads of them you know twice a day you know six days a week you know so there was a lot of things that, that I had to make sure that I was ready for and so that you know that 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 really helps mm. really helps. yeah the nutrition is a, is a massive part particularly with track particularly with triathlon when you're dealing with the demands of three sports plus balancing the the responsibilities of life. That's a lot of load on your body and you have to fuel the work, you know, it, it, it tears you down otherwise. So you mentioned that, um, you're, you mentioned that you saw improvements in, in like on routes or on climbs and you saw, like you said, it wasn't a huge increase in FTP, but you started to, to feel different on the bike and feel stronger on the bike. Did you feel, um, looking forward to Ironman Copenhagen, which actually, or just ha- or Ironman Hamburg, forgive me, which just happened. Uh, did you feel more prepared coming in and more confident this time coming in? Uh, or were you still nervous because of the past experiences? It's kind of interesting, you know, I think again, a bit of both. Mm-hmm. And then of course you had the COVID overlay, right? So yeah. I was actually now in a taxi for the first time heading to an airport on a plane not done that in, in, in how many, you know, a year and a half almost. Um, and so what I found I needed to do for myself at that point was actually in the taxi. I remember it quite clearly. I had to ask myself, what is the anxiety here? Is it because you're traveling or is it because of the event? You know, and then I realized it was actually really because of the travel. And so I thought, okay. Mm-hmm. And so it was just taking step by step. Um, I, I was excited about the event, really. I, I knew I was prepared. Just, just as for the other ones, I knew I had been prepared. At least I had trained as, you know, as hard as possible. I knew I was ready. Um, I knew I had good race strategy. I mean, I'd studied and swatted. I knew every cutoff that there was. Um, I even realized, oh, there's a cutoff on the run as well, is there? Okay, then. Because there was a cutoff <laughs> on the run. Yeah. Um, and um, so I knew all of those things. And, and I think what, what I determined was that I would just go and have, I just go, I kind of thought, let me just have a training session. Let me just go out and do as if I was training, because it's nothing really different to actually if I was going for a long swim or a long bike or a long, a long ride. The only thing I have to be mindful of are, of are the cutoffs. And so that's kind of the way I approached it. But the other thing that was there that was scary was um, what had happened to me in um, in Emilia Romagna, and I didn't understand what that was. And when I had spoken to my coach about it, um, my coach then at the time about it, um, he he um, kind of put it down to or said it was must have been something I'd eaten, mm. you know, that had kind of just unsettled my body chemistry or something like that. Mm. Um, and so that too had kind of left me kind of concerned, you know, what should I eat? What should I not eat? What should I not eat? You know, 
And so whilst I was out there, you know, I was kind of just trying to eat plain stuff, you know, stay away from this or stay away from that, it's just as plain as possible. And I actually got out there, first time ever actually, got out there on the Monday because I wasn't sure what the um, what the protocol would be. And so by the time I had to finalise my flight and finalise the hotel, um, I thought, okay, if I get out on the Monday and if I have to be in quarantine for five days and do a test and release, at least I've got enough time to do that. And then I can be out on the Thursday, Friday, and then I can do whatever I all, all I needed to do. But as it happened anyway, so I, so I got out on the Monday, but you know, I didn't need to. Um, I knew that at the time or before the time then anyway, but when I was making all the arrangements, I didn't know and it wasn't really clear and anything could happen because it was all so yeah. out. <laughs> and that's just the world we live in now, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yep. absolutely yeah. crazy. And so I got out on the Monday and I think that actually helped because usually mm. I'd get out on a Thursday and you're kind of already in race weekend and race, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so in any of the, in, 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 with the halves I've done and with the, the fulls I've attempted. Um, and uh, and I, I think that helped. So I then settled, kind of eased into the day and I'd taken some time off work for all of that period. And so it was kind of backing away from that as well. Um, and then just easing in. And I think that was really quite helpful. Um, yeah. What was interesting though was I, I had a, just to add a bit of drama to you, perhaps the rest of the, the concern and the, 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 the anxiety that I'm trying to work on was I had a bit of a fall. So I put my bike back together um, on the Monday night when I had arrived and went out for a, a spin on the, on the Tuesday. And it was a bit crazy. The roads, there was lots of construction, road closures, you know, traffic is arrows pointing that they're going this way, there are crosses there and traffic is coming that way. And everything was just... And I was trying to, I was now lost in the city, trying to get back to the hotel and um, find that I'm kind of on the other wrong side of the road, you know, traffic is coming in this mm-hmm. way. And I'm thinking, okay, let me just try and get on. And I just misnegotiate this curve, this curb. Mm. And the next thing I know, I'm on on the floor. Yeah. And so I, 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 I literally go into that event having taken for that, from that Monday, from that Tuesday morning, Right up until this this this, this Saturday night, ibuprofen and and paracetamol <laughs> because I was in um I was I was in pain. Oh, it's so many. It's 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 been delayed for so long, right? Like you had this event that you're planning on doing. It's been delayed for so long, and then the week of that's when something happens, right? Coming up into it. Um, yeah. and you had worked so hard on and done a good job of trying to identify sources of anxiety and address them, uh, appropriately give them the attention they deserve. And you showed up with time to spare. It just shows that you can try to prepare as much as you can, but chaos still happens. Yeah. And you know, I came to that realization as well. In fact, I, I did a, a, a half Ironman in that 2019. It was, um, in Vichy in, in, in France. And I was on the bike stage of that event and it was, it was a hard stage. It was a hard, 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 um, it was a hard, um, a hard profile. And mm. I'm up there in the, in, in, and that's, it was sunny. It was hard. And I, I said to myself, I said, you know what, Joy, whether you complete this or you don't, I said, you are an iron man because I've been doubting this all the while. Mm. You know, but out there in in the heat, in the pain, in the pushing, I said, "My God, I'm an Iron Man." Whether I finish that or not, and I, and I think this is something that I, I realized that that is a lot within us. We have to really own these things ourselves. You know, I suppose mm-hmm. it's 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 our doubts. I guess that's why they call themselves doubts, right? You know, it, we have to deal with them personally, and mm-hmm. in those in, in in that in that in that in that hill on those hills. I actually just came to that realization and I didn't actually complete the event that day. I got back to, um, to T2, had just missed the cutoff, um, had some cramps. It was really terrible. It was a terribly hot day. It was a terribly, mm-hmm. terribly hot day. Um, and I didn't feel bad in the slightest. Hmm. Cause you started to believe it. You didn't yes. let that result start to, you know, those challenges yeah. define you as much as you, you found your own definition. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that's exactly it. And so when I had that fall, you know, again, that realization that, you know what, things can happen, you know, things outside of your control can happen. And it doesn't, 
mean? Because it's making, you know, someone's an Olympian or they're a gold medalist. They didn't get the gold this time. Doesn't mean they're not an Olympian or they're not a gold medalist or they're not, you know, they're not right. a successful, brilliant athlete or whatever it might be. And and so I came to that kind of, I just resolved that, you know, mm-hmm. for, for, for myself. And that was really good. And, and so what I had to then do was just figure out how to manage what I had put myself into. I was thankful that I was okay. In fact, I think one of the first things I said was, oh, my body. And yeah. it was so much, you know, it was like, you know, this, this, this machine of mine, what have I done to it? You know, yeah, yeah. it was hoping that it was okay and that I could perform and that my bike was okay. And thankfully my bike was okay. Um, where I'd hurt, um, it didn't seem to bother me if I was like that mm. or, and I'd gone out running the next day or if I were running. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'll just keep on taking the, the, um, the ibuprofen and the, the um, paracetamol and um, I'm sure I'd be fine. Um, and so I did. And I just didn't let it, I didn't let it bother me. I actually didn't nice. let it bother yeah. me. And on that race morning, it was, um, it was all exciting. I have to say, we haven't even talked about that race. Yeah. And, and I'm going to give like a spoiler alert in the sense that we've already covered it. You finished, um, which is awesome. You got that medal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you fulfilled your own prophecy, right. In in the sense that you achieved what you set out to do. I want to talk about this race in the lens of what you did differently this time compared to what you had done previously. So what were unique things, new things, novel things that you had done? We already talked about the preparation and how you had uh, done a great job of trying to give yourself plenty of time to get there and, and done that sort of thing. Your training, you also were able to get in a position where you could do your training and you could check those boxes and you had plenty of time to do it as it kept uh, getting pushed back. But let's talk race execution. How did you execute differently on this day than you had in the past? I stayed very calm, I suppose, really. I mean, when it came to Copenhagen, I, I, I guess I had never hit upon anything like that before, you know, in terms of that cutoff and that disappointment. And so I went in there really excited and, you know, and, and eager as well as, you know, slightly apprehensive of, you know, of, of all that was going on, but not feeling out of depth. Um, this time it's like, you know, you could probably say I came to it like a, like a veteran. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I came to it with, a, with, you know, with, with quite a lot of experience. Um, and so I had said, you know, it's just going to be a long day. You're just going to go for a long swim, a long bike, and a long, a long, a long run. Um, I seeded myself because I, again, I, I determined that I would always seed myself now ahead so as to give time. Um, something I faffed around with in, in in Copenhagen was trying to sort out stuff on 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 after I'd come out of the swim. It's always difficult trying to get things on onto a wet body, and so I had just determined that I would whatever I was going to use on the bike is what I would I would um, I would have under my wetsuit. And so that was what, that was it. <laughs> Minus the, the socks and the, and the sure. cycling shoes, of course. <laughs> um, so that, that's what I did. Um, and that saved me some, some, some time. Um, the, 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 the bike stage was a bit difficult because it was, um, well, it was windy. It was raining. It was, it was actually quite, quite, quite challenging. And so you hadn't quite dried out when you, you, you came back from the run. But I also had said to myself, I would, I would, work hard to give myself at least a, a nice good clear hour as best I could for any of those cutoffs to allow for any sort of eventuality if there's anything you know that that I had to take care of hoping that I didn't have anything to take care of hoping that I'd have no puncture and that my body would actually be in good shape and all I had to do was just push it you know push it through and so I, I did that and then I decided that I would obviously fuel so I I had a bike, my bike, um, bike bag on my saddle, saddle bag. Um, and I had just put it with all the stuff that I was going to consume over, over the bike stage. Cause that was really where I was going to do most of the, the most of the, uh, the, the, um, feeding, the fueling as it were. And so I had it nicely laid what I'll have now, what I'll have in 30 minutes, what I'll have in the next 30 minutes and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had my bottles. I was going to make sure that I, gave myself every opportunity to get onto the run because I'd never had that opportunity before right? to get onto the run. And so I wanted to pedal and fuel and ensure that I got onto that run, you know, and, and, and that was, that was, that was all I wanted to see, you know, just get out, mm. get, get, get onto that. And it really wasn't until, until 
I got on to, got to T2 thinking, my God, I've got, I think I had an hour or something like that, um, you know, before that end you of stage it. cut off. Yeah. You made thinking, it. Oh, wow. It was, and it was amazing because I said, okay, I have made it. And I thought, you know, so I changed because I also wanted to change. So I had to, wanted to have proper running gear on. And so I did that. So I had a bit of a long transition there, but I needed to change. And again, I was all wet, you know, because mm-hmm. it had just been, it stopped raining now, but it was, it had been also, also wet. Um, and then I got onto the run and I just had to keep running to pass because on the, on the third lap, uh, you had to get there by a certain time. Otherwise you could not carry on. And so that I was, had to make sure. You were focused on that, right? I was focused on that. I was focused on that. And so I pushed as hard as I could. Um, I had some issues with my shins to begin with and I'm thinking oh no 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 <laughs> um and, but then I carried on running but it was a difficult run so I don't know whether I, I think maybe I pushed quite a lot to try and get to to um 31 which was where that cutoff was um because the last 10k was was was, was difficult and I was yeah. running walking by the time I was doing that last 10k I think I was walking running I don't think I've walked more in doing a <laughs> doing a running than ever in that event it was um it was quite uh it was quite interesting actually and then with I'm good thinking, reason well, you're a runner and you know you're walking <laughs> yeah with good reason you've done a whole lot prior to that right uh, um if if I can get into the mindset of what happened when you had those the pains in your shins and those things that came up that were like, oh no, something is wrong. How did you react to that? Like what, what were the things that you told yourself or the things you did internally to manage those? I did quite a few things. I did them on the bike too, because again, it was raining. You know, when it rains, there's lots of, um, invariably you have punctures, right? People get punctures, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, you know, and you're on the bike course and then you see this person, you pass them and they've got a puncture and you think, you know, God, you know, and in truth, I'd say a little prayer that my body and that my bike would be good. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, um, and so I carry that too on the run, um, you know, that, um, and I realized actually that I wasn't doing it as much on the run as I had been on the bike and maybe I should have done a bit more, but anyway, it would just be to say a little prayer. But when I, when the shins happened, I kind of just stopped and rubbed them a little bit, kind of just give them some more because it had been cold all day. Um, yeah. It'd been raining. So the body was, um, you know, yes, yeah, so it was a bit, it was a bit difficult. I guess the body was a bit cold. So I just kind of tried to warm them up a little, um, by rubbing, um, loosened my, uh, my, my shoelaces a little bit. So the elastic, uh, my elastic laces, mm. and then just prayed that it'd be okay and that I'd be fine. And, and it was, and so I carried on and yeah. it was just always just to try and just stay, to stay calm, I suppose, is really what I just, kept on telling myself because I also came to I'd done some calculations I know people power walk a marathon in five hours Mm. and so I'm thinking even if I have to power walk it you know maybe I could still do it and complete you know and still cross the finish line and so I just kind of stayed calm in fact it was only when I was on the run that I actually allowed myself to think you know that we that we had this I didn't do that on the bike not for a moment not until I actually put the bike on the rack and I had transitioned. Um, mm. But it was then I actually began to, to, to think that, yes, we have got this. And then by the time I passed that 30, 31 K mark, it was like, you know, I could crawl to the finish line. You know, I could crawl <laughs> for the next 10 K and still get there in time um, because I had given myself enough time. And I was great, grateful for that. I was glad for that. Um, so yes, it was yeah. just a bit of positive thinking and a bit of prayer. <laughs> What did, what did it feel like to cross the line? And I want to set some context for this as well. You mentioned before, um, there aren't many black triathletes. Um, Sika Henry is the first black woman triathlete to hold a pro card. And this is, and she's a previous guest on this podcast and she's an inspiration. Um, you are in a situation where you have a track record of, of not having finished this distance. So you have two reasons to doubt. Mm -hmm. Then you have all the different opportunities that you've had in between then to really listen to that doubt, to further cement it. And then when you look at a field, you also, you don't see yourself reflected, right? Mm -hmm. So you have all of these things adding up to tell yourself the bad voices in the back of your head that you don't belong. What did it feel like to cross that line? What did it mean? 
<laughs> it was absolutely amazing to cross that line. Um, I, I had my hands flung up in the air. I mean, it was amazing because actually I'd seen that line a few times. As you carry on the lap, you know, you could either lap or the runway to the finish, mm. you know, so I had anticipated it, you know, you know, from about the 10K, 20K, 30K effectively and seeing people run down there and thinking that's going to be me. That's going to be me soon. That's going to be me. Um, and when I came powering down there, you know, coming on the runway there, actually all of a sudden feeling like I could just run forever. Mm-hmm. And then I crossed mm-hmm. and it was just victorious. I, and I kind of threw my hands up and then I began to beat my chest because it was the most amazing amazing feeling the amazing most amazing achievement i was i was i was really really pleased and proud of myself without a doubt yeah right right and once again rightfully so uh i feel like on this podcast in particular we've interviewed so many uh ironman triathletes in particular that are shooting for like nine hours and eight hours and and i think that we lose perspective on how hard it is to even do one and then when you factor in all the other factors that you were dealing with, it's even more difficult. Um, what an accomplishment. And I love that what you did is you had business unresolved and mm-hmm. instead of leaving it as such, you chose to take it head on and you chose to believe that you were going to do what you set out to do. That's, that's powerful. That's, that extends far beyond sport. I'm, I'm really grateful for your example, Joy. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, Joy, what's next for you? You're an Ironman. Um, what's next for you now? <laughs> what's next? It's really interesting, you know, because I'm thinking, you know, when when I was um, registering that day, registering in in, in um, Hamburg um, at the event, they had asked whether I wanted to enter in for the championships. And I'm thinking, oh, I never thought about that before. So um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would honestly like to think that there there are a few more. I mean, I certainly will do a lot of a, a few more for a few more halves. Um, I will. I, I believe I will do another one. Um, I think that I can, um, I should like to be able to run the distance. Yeah. Um, what yeah, a goal like that to, would be, right? I'd like to be able to run the distance. So um, so let's wait and see. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, I've also got my eye on this, um, um, on this uh, six majors, marathon majors, which I haven't done before, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. So get all of those done. Um, London, Tokyo, Berlin, Paris, Boston, New York, um, Chicago. I've only got London. Um, so I've also got that kind of on my mind. I might do that over the next year or two um, whilst fitting in a few, uh, few maybe half Ironman. How cool. Um, Joy, I appreciate you taking the time to talk, uh, talk to us and share your story uh, like this. It's hugely inspiring. Uh, personally, very inspiring. I have a very big race coming up here. And if you're listening to this in the past, it's yes, whatever it's going to be. Epic. Cape Epic. Yeah. And I'm just hoping I can finish really like we'll see. <laughs> so uh, this is really inspiring for me. And, and I appreciate this. This is fantastic. Joy, if, if people want to get in touch with you, are you on social media or anything else where people can, can find you there? I am on, um, on, on Twitter. Um, and, um, I think that's just about it. And then LinkedIn, but I think that's perhaps a bit more professional. Um, and it's, um, um, J A B O I M at, uh, at Twitter. Perfect. We'll link to that below in the description on this podcast and on the, on the YouTube video description as well. And if you're listening to this and you want to share your story about how trainer road has helped you accomplish something, please do. So you can do it at trainerroadcom slash S A P doesn't matter what your level of success is that you've achieved with trainer road. I'd love to hear about it. So, uh, please go over there and share that and share this podcast with your friends and go check out trainer road like joy did to go accomplish whatever big goals you have. So thanks joy. We'll talk to you soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. Thank you.